Well, this is a hot one. This is a hot one. Hot, 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 hotty, hotty one. So, as most of you are, I think, do you, are most of you aware? 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 Maybe not. But there was a bit of conversation earlier in the year, right? When the whole Bon Appetit thing was going down, and you know there was a lot of there was a lot of um, accusations of discrimination, um, unfair pay, bad working conditions, all the nice stuff that you associate with the wonderful place that is known as Condé Nast, right? And there was a bit of pressure that was being put on, you know, the main honcho over there, Anna Winter where they were essentially suggesting that her time had come, she's part of the old guard, she doesn't understand what the new generation wants and needed some fresh new blood um, in Condé Nast to sort of steer the ship in a new into the new frontier. And the pressure was sort of mounting, right? There were people coming out with stories about some of the um, bad working conditions they were worked in uh, under during an internship and just loads of very questionable and interest no questionable and maybe pressurizing sort of stories that you know for anybody else would feel the heat and immediately try and get out of the kitchen to avoid any um possible scandal or any reputation damage but of course if you're Anna Wintour and you've got you know decades and decades of experience in the industry you've seen your fair share of scandals you've seen your fair share of employee uproar and she's put herself in a position or Condé Nassa put her, her in a position where she essentially has carte blanche should do exactly what she wants and if anything the conversations that she had in the beginning you know trying to reconcile between some of the bon appetit staff and some other people in fashion were basically her way of kind of being charitable she probably didn't need to have the sit down she probably didn't need to you know emphasize that she was going to do you know racial diversity training bullshit or anti-racist whatever she was talking about right that was just probably her way of being courteous i think if she wanted to she could have easily ignored it and moved on and just continued going on like nothing happened because if the reason why i say that is because of this news that came out completely nowhere right um new york times Condé Nas puts anna winter in charge of magazines worldwide people are now referring to her as like Cersei Lannister mate she's just the boss of everything so from one minute from getting threatened and you know being called out and being told to step down from your job to then suddenly turning around you know middle finger behind your back and saying mm, I'm gonna be the boss of everything now I give myself a promotion that is some boss shit says here the veteran um, editor gets more power and two new job titles chief content officer and global editorial director of Vogue <laughs> Uh, this is from M. Edmund Lee. It says, going into this week, Anna Winter was already one of the um, most popular people in the magazine world. She'd been editor in chief of the United States edition of Vogue since 1988. Insane that she's hung on this long. I wonder what it is about people in these sort of positions. You see a lot with Anna DeGeneres, right? They just don't want to let go of that power. I wonder what it is. This must be intoxicating, isn't it? But imagine being at the top or being at the pinnacle um, of your industry, right? Being the go-to person being the connector uh you know at that level and you're still holding on now especially with all the you know uh in especially with all the sort of like social movements happening at the moment right the conversations happening are, are you know even for myself i'm a fairly young guy but they're pretty tiring to kind of keep abreast of what's going on pay attention make sure you're doing your part and imagine somebody older doing that sort of thing right it's just it must be exhausting, like keeping up with all that stuff. But you know, I guess if you're, I guess it's part of your makeup, and you just, I don't know, I don't know. It's mad. 1988 is just insane. I thought it was like later than that. I don't know why I didn't know 90. Anyway, continue. This is the director of Vogue's parent company, Condé Nast, since 2013, and the company's global content advisor since 2019. So she's been giving herself a, a, a raise or a bump, you know, quite recently since 2013. Anyway, continues. On Tuesday, as part of the larger revamping Condé Nast announced that Miss Wintour will have a pair of new titles worldwide chief content officer and global editorial director of Vogue giving her the final say of her publications in more than 30 markets around the world I'm sure the editors-in-chief of Vogue Turkey and Germany and shit are going to be over the moon about this I'm sure they are <laughs> in addition uh, to the evaluation uh, ev elevation sorry elevation of its editorial leader Condé Nast announced that Amy Astley um, a confidant of Miss Winter will be the global editorial director of AD um, the title formerly known as Architectural Digest Will Welch will become the global editor of GQ oh that's awesome I know Will or I know of him online um, Diva Tani will be given the role um, of Condé Nast Traveller 
Edward Enifo, of course, um, Vogue UK legend, the most powerful black editor at Condé Nast, was made the head of Vogue's editions in Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Spain. <sighs> I wonder what happens to Emmanuel Ultimate. Um, Simone Marchetti will be given the European Editorial Director of Vanity Fair, putting him in charge of the editions in France, Italy and Spain. The American British versions of Vanity Fair will remain under the tutelage of Radhika Jones. Of the six weekly so of the six newly created top leadership roles within the editorial division, two went to people of colour. Condon has said that the worldwide editorial directors will be named for its un other publications earlier this year. See, they even have to do, like, imagine having to prescribe job opportunities to people of colour in fashion just because you have so many, like... There is a good thing in it, right? It's obviously, it comes from a good place, but it does show you the amount of whitewashing in fashion, right? They present you one face in the magazines. You see all these amazing, diverse casts of models and, you know, brand owners and stuff, but people actually working behind the scenes. It's just, you know, full on beige. I said before, like when I went to Central London one day and I ended up, uh, you know, randomly, I was, I was outside Vogue House, right? The office of Vogue magazine, of course, in Central. I think it's one of them. I don't know if it's the main one. But it happened to be the same time I was standing out there on my bike, like trying to fix a punch or something. I don't know why I was there. I was just on my bike, just ch chilling, probably watching some of the girls come out or they're coming out for lunch. Happened to be the same time that the fire alarm went off and they all just came out, right? The whole building started piling out into the streets. And the one thing I realized straight I was like, oh, cool, fair enough. There's a lot of pretty girls that work at Vogue. Cool. That, that's, you know, that's part of the course. But I was like, Jesus Christ, a lot of white girls, isn't it? just white upon like you see the old asian lady here and there um but that was it just white 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 and, I, and that made me think oh, okay so all these sort of you know um affirmative action sort of things that they're doing in terms of putting certain people of color in positions as cringe as they are um as maybe counterproductive as they can be they're actually essential because they generally don't have different voices um represented within those builders or the bit or sometimes the voices they're trying to communicate to aren't in those rooms so when you see some really foolish decisions to put some stupid you know t-shirt on somebody on the fashion shoot it's usually because they don't have anyone else that's objecting in the room it's just people that look exactly like them so again it's cringy but again it, it, it it's just another indication of just how much you know, how intoxicating this power to Anna Winter that she'd want to be around during this whole reshuffle because for sure something else will go wrong, you know, doing this restructure. It will be, you know, everyone's happy with it because they've got a new gig. But over time, once the sort of, you know, once the dust settles, people will have something else to complain about and she's still going to be there hanging on for dear life. It continues, it says, until now the international editions of many Condé Nast titles were run largely by the top editors in the countries. Of course, that's what Emmanuel the Alt comes in, who's a very powerful a uh, person within uh, Vogue Paris. Um, it says here, yeah, so largely run by the top editors in the countries where they are based. With the shakeup, the leadership team in New York will have more oversized part of what the company trans uh, described in the news release as the global unification of the brand editorial teams. Now, I wonder what this is about because obviously a lot of people have been complaining about Vogue Paris, right? Um, is it Vogue Paris or Vogue France? Vogue France, right? Um, Vogue FR, sorry, that's um, under the tutelage of Emmanuel Alt that was formerly under the tutelage of uh, Karin Reutfeld and I guess Emmanuel Alt and Karen Warfeld fell out somehow. It was an epic beef. I remember back in the day when I used to be on like Fashion Spot Forum, you'd always you know read about this sort of like tit 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 they had, and somehow within the shakeup, she managed to hold on to some of the better stylists at um, Vogue France. Um, you know, and a uh, thing which Karen Warfeld took a couple of her to see our magazine, but all in all, it sort of felt you know it made sense. But then over time, Emmanuel Alt's vision and styling hasn't really evolved. This sort of the same old you know sailory kitschy french girl sort of vibe that she kind of continually does it's always kind of really sparkly dresses to go out at night or stripes and boat shoes to go out in a day it's not really anything different from that but there's still some great t t styling tips in there because i still think she's a you know up there with one of the best stylists in the world still even though it, her sort of vision taste is sort of a bit dated but there is a lot of pushback from the fans from what i see where they basically say she's just boring in it she's killing her magazine and people that are working there with her too there's another lady too that's a sort of like right hand woman i forgot her name um they have sort of a similar sort of vision so i wonder if this was a shake-up in place where they're waiting to be like hey that's one of our biggest markets we can't lose that we can't lose that magazine we can't lose that fan base or the customer base we'd rather kind of bring it all in-house under the new york leadership so we can kind of guide them in the right way and there's also another thing i read online where supposedly with vogue 
Spain, um, some of the people, you know, upper, you know, in the upper echelons of um, Condé Nast were unhappy that they would, you know, feature Zara bits and pieces there. Um, I guess, you know, of course, you know, Zara is obviously based there. Um, what's his name? Uh, Ortega, the main dude uh, for the company that owns uh, Zara is obviously a very influential, very powerful figure. But I heard that that was an issue as well. So that might be part of the problem. That might be part of the reason why they did this big shakeup. Or it could just be because, you know, they're feeling the heat and they kind of want to be seen to do something performative. Who knows? But regardless, interesting. Um, last bits here says the further promotion of Miss Winter 71 comes after she was criticized by members of her own staff for fostering a workplace that sidelined women of color the move also comes as a res um, respite to years of whispers and gossip columns at the industry standard parties that she would be leaving Vogue which she's never going to do she's going to die on that table no offense God willing she doesn't die anytime soon but she's definitely going to um, have to be you know pulled out of there um against her will says here robert roger lynch sorry the Condé Nast chief executive made his support clear in a statement on tuesday saying anna's appointment represents a pivotal moment uh, for Condé Nast as an ability to stay ahead of in connecting with a new audience while cultivating and mentoring some of the today's brightest talents in the industry has made her one of the world's also, I want to meet this most distinguished executives. The New Yorker is one of Condon Nassau's publications that is not part of Miss Winter's purview. Uh, David Rimnick, da, 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 we don't care about New Yorker. Uh, da, 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 da. So, yeah. Who's this? Oh, so who, who stepped down? Shortly after the corporate reconstruction. Oh, the promotion of Miss Winter. Three powerful editors of Vogue's international, international left the company. See, already. Uh, Angelica Chung, um, the head of Vogue China, for nearly two decades stepped down last Tuesday. Vogue China has been one of Condé Nast's top performing titles, one of the rare US media brands that has gained a large following in China. Soon after Miss Chang's exit, um, Christina Arp, the head of Vogue Germany, announced her departure. Also this month, the head of Vogue Spain, Eugenia de la Torre de la Torriente, um, said that she'll be leaving the company. So pff, three big people there, right? Vogue China, Vogue Germany, and Vogue Spain editors all stepped down and said that the changes come as a company grapples with declining sales and staff unrest over issues of diversity and inclusion. The company has also had to, to contend with the shaking, the shrinking base of print readers, which has led to layoffs and pay cuts. <sighs> Yeah, but you know, Anna Winter, sorry, uh, Anna Winter didn't get a pay cut, did she? I bet she did not. But again, interesting to see how that goes on. Um, I'm sure there are some who have been, you know, who've got, uh, who benefited greatly from this shakeup, others who haven't benefited at all, and some who have could be continue to be looked over, overlooked in some respects, because, you know, fashion is a hell of an industry to make it in. But again, interesting um, shakeup. I'll be interested to see how this develops over time.